First Samuel, First Samuel, chapter number seventeen. <clears throat> this is a story we all know. That we've all been taught since we were small children. If you've ever been to church anywhere, you've heard this biblical truth. <clears throat> This wonderful Bible story that is told to us, everybody knows it. I'm telling you, I, I love this section of Scripture. There's not a, a preacher alive that couldn't preach a hundred messages from this one chapter. Um, <clears throat> there are just stories that stand out to us in the Word of God. Just like in Daniel 3 where we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three men in the fiery furnace. We know that there's Daniel 6 with Daniel in the lion's den. We all know the stories that we read in Judges with um, <clears throat> when we talk about Samson and Delilah. Um, we all know the stories about Abraham and him offering Isaac. Things that we learned <clears throat> as children, but are all extremely powerful, powerful pieces of Scripture that give us true hope in everyone. All right? Now, <clears throat> as we look at this, I, last week we talked about the value of faith. The importance of having faith. Because it told us in Hebrews eleven six that without faith, it's impossible, impossible to please God. Because God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. Those that believe that He is. All right? Those are the people that he is a rewarder of. Those that believe. So we understood the value of faith. And <clears throat> I actually had a different message that I thought the Lord had laid on my heart this week. Then Friday evening, um, <clears throat> my grandchildren, the three big grandchildren, played their first Little League Baseball game this year. And so we were there, and we were there early, and Missy and I were standing there, and the kids were running everywhere, and not just our kids, but all kids that run everywhere. We were trying to get uniforms out and trying to get them on, and the kids were running around, tucking their shirts in, just the excitement that was in the air, the enthusiasm that they had. And you could look at those kids, and I know when I coached baseball for so many years, the one thing I always loved was the time before that first game because no matter who the kid was, no matter what their athletic ability was, no matter whether they were any good at baseball or not, before that first game, they were invincible. Okay? <laughs> there wasn't a ball that was going to get by them. There wasn't a ball that any pitcher threw that wasn't going to get hit. They were going to be fantastic. And to see that enthusiasm and that excitement on those children's faces and the excitement of being able to go play <clears throat> baseball, I started to think as I was standing there watching them, and I started to think about David. And it brought me right back to this, to the story of David and Goliath. And I started to think David was exactly that same way when he came and saw what Goliath was doing. He was an excited youngster. Don't forget, David, when we start this story, David was the youngest of eight. He had seven older brothers. At this time, David was still a teenager. 
Most theologians believe that he was probably about the ages of 16 or 17. Most believe 17. But it doesn't matter. He was still in his late teens as a teenager when he came. His father sent him to the front lines where the Israelites were challenging the Philistines. The Philistines, <laughs> as they had done several times before, but had tried to invade parts of what we know as Judah. And they were trying to invade and come into it. Well, the armies of Israel had gone to meet them. And they were in this valley, a valley called Elah, but they were in this, there was a valley between them, and each one of them were up on a hill. They call it the mountain. It really wasn't a mountain. It was two hills. And you had the Israelite army on this side, and you had the Philistine army on this side, and there was a little valley below them. And in that valley below them was a dried up creek bed. And so that's where that battle was going to take place when they decided to have this battle. So for 40 days, they were preparing for battle, standing across the hill from each other, looking at one another. So Jesse, the, the dad of David, pulls David, who was the shepherd of a few sheep, not a lot of sheep, a few sheep. We know that because we know Jesse wasn't rich. He didn't have a lot of money. So he only had a few sheep. Well, David was watching over those sheep. So he sends, and he gets David, and he brings him home, and he says, I've got this food, and I want you to take this food to your brothers up there where they're about to battle with the Philistines. So David is excited. Number one, he wanted to go and he couldn't go. So now he gets to go. He may not get to fight, but at least he's going to get to go see his brothers and he's going to get to see what's going on. So he goes to the front. And as he gets there, he starts to talk to his brothers and he starts to give them the things that their dad sent and, you know, and giving them the hellos. Dad said this, and Daddy said that, and you know. And as he's doing that, Goliath, as he had done for the past 40 days, walks out on the edge of that hillside and challenges and taunts Israel just like he had done for the past 40 days. And he comes out on there and he says, You send your champion over here to fight me, and whoever wins will be the servant of the other. Now, you may think that that sounds abnormal, but at this time, that was actually normal. In history, it was proven that lots of times that instead of nations paying the high cost of war, what they would do would send their two best soldiers into one place and they would fight. And whoever won, that's who won. And they did that often. So it wasn't unusual that Goliath was doing it. Now you have to go back and remember we look at David and Goliath and we look at little David fighting a giant. You have to go back and remember as they were about to cross into the promised land and they send out the 10 spies or the 12 spies. The only two of them came back with a positive result. But as they sent them out and the ten spies come back, what are they talking about? They said, this land is full of giants. There's no possible way that we can defeat these people. But then we remember that Joshua and Caleb come back and tell a completely different story. It's like, man, you ought to see the size of the fruit in this place. You should see the greatness of the pasture land that they had. You should see the glory that God has provided for us. Now remember, God told them all they had to do was to cross the river Jordan and he would drive those people out in front of him. But they didn't remember that because what they had seen were giants. Now you have to remember in the book of Joshua it tells us about a king who had to have a bed made that was 13 feet 3 inches long to hold his body. So a 9 foot 9 inch tall Goliath was not a big giant. 
but he was a giant. Because you have to remember that David, and we get this on up through as we read further into First and Second Samuel, David was of a smaller stature. David was probably only about five feet six, five feet seven, which was the average height for the Jew or the Israelite at that particular time. So here's a 17-year-old, five foot seven boy who is about to stand against a nine foot, nine inch tall warrior. But as they came out and they get to the battlefield and you see Goliath who comes out every day and he starts to taunt and torment the Israel. Send one of yours over here. Now, remember at this time, Saul was the king. Now, Saul was different than most other Israelites. Saul was one of those things, he was one of those human beings that, that you women think are the greatest thing in the world. Saul was about six foot, six inches tall, dark hair, very good looking, ripped muscles, ab muscles everywhere, okay? He probably didn't have a six pack, probably had an eight pack. I mean, this boy was built, all right? He was one of those Adonises that you may see. That's who Saul was. It's one of the reasons that he was chosen as king. Right? Now remember, God didn't choose him. The people did. And God just said, fine. If I say you want right now, <laughs> we'll, we'll do it now. But that's not my king. Okay? But Saul was the king. Now, stop and think about it. The average height of an Israelite was five feet seven. Saul was six foot six. Goliath was nine foot nine. Saul was in his tent every time that Goliath came out. Why? Now, if you had to pick your champion to go against a nine foot, nine inch tall warrior, who are you going to pick if you're on the Jewish side? I know who I'm picking. Saul. Because he's big. Okay, he's the biggest fella in the camp. And he looks good. You know, you put his armor on him, he looks even better. You know, he really looks like a warrior king. But where was Saul? And this is something we don't hear discussed a whole lot as we listen to this story. But where was Saul? Hiding in his tent. You say, oh, well, he was the king. He didn't have to do it. He said, let your greatest warrior come out. And if you read earlier in 1 Samuel, you'll see that Saul many times makes the claim that he is Israel's greatest warrior. <clears throat> now, up to this point, Saul's hiding in his tent because when he looked across and saw a nine-inch, nine-foot, nine-inch tall giant who was a trained warrior, he said, nope, no, thank you. So he was back here, as we would refer to in the rear with the gear, that's where Saul was, okay? He wasn't up front challenging Goliath, saying, I'll whip your behind. He was hiding. The king was hiding. Now, when the king was hiding, how was the rest of the army reacting? They were afraid. Right? If your leader is afraid, then I promise you the rest of his soldiers under him are going to be afraid because it's like, hey, if he's supposed to know what he's doing, he's supposed to be the greatest warrior that we have, and he's hiding back there, then shouldn't I be afraid of here? Absolutely. So that's where they were. They were full of fear. Because all they knew is that they weren't facing the Philistine army. They weren't afraid of the Philistines themselves. They had already whipped them more than once. They weren't afraid of an army across a hillside. They were afraid of a giant on the other hillside. That's what they were afraid of. The giant that was in front of them. So when I started to think about this, I started to think about how great 
of a testimony that David was. You know what God refers to David as? A man after his own heart. That's how he described David. That David was a man after God's own heart. That's powerful. Now, did David make mistakes in his life later on? Absolutely. We all know that. But this 17-year-old, short, little, skinny boy who was dressed like a shepherd that smelt like sheep proved that he had enough faith to face the giant. So that's what I want to talk quickly about this morning. I want us to look at the faith. And it's like I said, you could preach a hundred messages out of here. We could come back here every week for the rest of this year, and I could preach messages from this one thing, and none of them would be the same. Because that's how much God has given us in his power and strength through David and Goliath. But I want you to look at his faith. Number one, what kind of faith did he have? Simple faith. It was extremely simple. This giant comes out on the hill, and David sees him with his brothers. And David walks right up on the front of the hillside and looks at this big man who is challenging him, and he just stares at him. And he listens to every word he says. And then he turns around to his oldest brother and he said, hey, what is it? You can see it in verse 26. He said, what is the man who kills this guy going to get? You see his faith? Do you see what kind of faith he had? There was never a doubt in David's mind that Goliath was going to be defeated. He just wanted to know what whoever killed him was going to get. Now, he wasn't thinking about killing him himself. That's not what he was thinking about at this particular time. This was not what he was thinking about. He had grown up listening to the stories of how God's power had overcome Time after time after time. Every year he was celebrating the feast of the Passover. And you can't celebrate the feast of the Passover without discussing the parting of the Red Sea. And he had heard about it his entire life. How that the, the Egyptian army was coming up on the Israelites and how they started to complain, but what David saw was how God provided them an escape route. He parted the Red Sea. He let them go through, and he destroyed their enemies behind them. He had heard it time and time again. He had heard as they had come into the promised land, and he had even been to the city where it had happened. He had been into Jericho, and how this was the most fortified city in the world at this particular time that had walls that were made of rock and were over three feet thick and that you could not penetrate these walls, that nobody could crush their gates. There was no army that could defeat the city of Jericho. And how that God, after they had marched, never shot an arrow, never done anything, but day after day they followed the direction of God and how they had marched around this wall and the last time they marched seven times around the wall on that last day and the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. We all know the song. And he grew up with those stories because he knew they were true and they were real. <clears throat> You know why he knew they were true and they were real? Because there was a lady who came out of that same city. There was a lady who came out of that same city named Rahab who had 
ended up becoming a part of Israel because she had been saved from that city because of the spies. Later, her lineage went into what we know as Ruth. You remember Ruth? Who was the grandmother of David. We forget that lots of times. We forget the lineage and where it all came from. And we know that 14 generations after David, who do we have? Jesus Christ. Oh, David knew better than anybody that that story about Jericho was as real as it could be. And he had developed just this simple faith of knowing that there was absolutely no doubt in his mind that God was going to take care of him. Simple faith. He never doubted. You know, do we teach our children and our grandchildren today that they should never doubt the provision and the power of God? Or do what they see in us all the time is not simple faith, but it's doubting faith. Do they see that what we portray is absolutely no doubt that God is going to take care of the giant that is in front of us? Now, what giants are you facing in your life? It may be financial giants. It may be relationship giants. It may be a giant of sickness. It may be giants of whatever tribulation or trial that you're going through that to you right now looks like a great big giant in front of your little bitty self. But I'm telling you, David had absolutely no doubt in his mind that he was going to be defeated. He just said, what are you going to get when you kill that loud mouth over you? That's all he wanted to know. But there were so many other people that were afraid, just as his brothers. Because his oldest brother, Eliab, told him, he said, get over here and shut your mouth. He's like, are you out of your mind? And David said, hey, why don't you get up and go over there and whip his hind in and come on back? And his brother's like, have you seen him? He's like, look at him. Look how big that giant is. He's like, I'm not going over there. And David's like, well, I'll go. Well, there was... <clears throat> an old captain who was in there and he wasn't gone. And there wasn't nobody else volunteering. And Saul's back hiding in the tent saying, hey, you better find somebody to go shut him up. And so he heard David and he says, hey, come on with me. Let me take you back here to the king. And if you want to volunteer, brother, we'll let you. You know why? Because they didn't have that simple faith that he had. Where did that simple faith come from? It came from his living faith. His true living faith. You go down to verse 32. You can look at verse 32. And what does it say? He goes into Saul and he starts to talk to Saul. And Saul says to him, Saul says, you can't go fight Goliath. He said, you're just a boy. You're young and skinny. And little. And he said, This man has been a warrior since he was a boy. And by the way, did you look across and see how big he is? And David goes on to remind him about living faith. Faith that's a lie. Because David started to tell Saul about things that have happened. He said, listen, he said, I don't only just have faith when I go to church, okay? I don't only have faith when things are going good. He said, let me tell you, one day I was watching my sheep and all of a sudden a lion came out of the woods 
and was going to try to eat my sheep. And what did he say? He said, I whacked it on the head. And he said, and then because I whacked that lion on the head, that lion tried to eat me. Now, you all know the story, but I'm giving it to you just like David told it broke down. Huh? He said, after I hit it on the head, that stupid thing tried to eat me, so he said, then I killed it. He said, I'll teach you to try to eat me. And he said, and then a few days later, watching the same sheep, the same place, the bear comes out of the woods, and the bear tries the same thing. So I hit it on the head. And then that stupid thing tried to eat me, and I killed it too. He said, so I'm going to tell you this. He said, God, not my power, not my strength. He said, God delivered me out of the paw of the lion, and God delivered me out of the paw of the bear. And he said, God will deliver me from this unbelieving Philistine. You see, his faith was a lie. And why was it alive? Because he remembered all the times that God had helped him before. He remembered all the times that God had helped Israel before. Not only did he have absolutely no doubt, but his faith was alive because he said, hey, I have proof in my life that God is real, that God does take care of me. He said, I'm a little skinny kid. And he said, I killed a lion and I killed a bear with my bare hands because God gave me the strength to do it. Because God delivered me. And so after hearing that, Saul says to him, all right then. He said, if you're that confident, then you go and you fight this junk. So then, and we're going to come back to some of the things that happened real quickly. But then he moves on over. All right, now remember, so far it's been easy for David. David didn't have any doubt that Goliath was going to be defeated. David remembered the victories that God had given him. Now comes the true test. David goes out and walks down into the valley. And he picks up five smooth stones and he sticks them in his shepherd's bag. And he takes his slingshot out and he holds it in his hand. And he has his staff, which he would use to fight off stuff <clears throat> as a shepherd. And he has his staff in his hand, in one hand, and a slingshot in the other. And he walks off of that hillside down into the valley. And Goliath looks down there and sees this little skinny kid. And you know what the Bible says? It said it disdained him. He disdained him. You know what that means? He despised that little boy. Goliath despised that little punk. Why? Because when Goliath came off that hill, he expected to fight somebody like Saul. He expected to be fighting somebody who was ripped with muscles and good looking and some kind of great warrior who was going to come down there in the same armor that he had on and fight him hand to hand. And what he got was a skinny little kid holding a slingshot and a stick. And he walked off that hill already mad. And he gets down there and he starts to yell at David. He said, am I a dog that they send you down here to fight me with sticks? And he said, boy, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to leave you out here for the buzzards to eat. And then David got mad. Because David then said, <clears throat> let me tell you something. He said, who do you think you are that you will stand and defy the one true living God? You are nobody. He said, my God will deliver you to, to me this day. And he even told him what he said he was going to do. He said, I'm going to cut your head off and then I'm going to leave the rest of your body for the buzzards and the wolves and the coyotes and everything else to eat. He said, because 
The Lord of hosts, and that's an important word that we don't think about very much when we study the word of God anymore. The Lord of hosts will deliver you to me. You know what the Lord of hosts translates into? The Lord, the God of my extremities. The God of my hands and my arms. The God of my body. The God of my legs. The God of my feet. The God that works me. You see how important that is? When you see Lord of hosts, that's what he's talking about. The God that is within me. The God that directs me. The God that makes everything work. He said that God is the God that's going to deliver you to me. Now as he stood across from him and he started to taunt him and tell him that he was going to kill him, what kind of faith did he have then? You see, that was the true test of his faith because he was standing just feet away from his journey, facing him face to face. He didn't have his brothers to help him. He didn't have the army of Israel in that valley behind him. He stood alone against that giant. And that's Christ's faith. That shows us who we are in the time of crisis. Because there's no bigger crisis than facing your giant. All right? And David did it without any fear, without any worry. God told him, he said, David, I'm going to take your abilities. I'm going to take your past victories. I'm going to take your talents. I'm going to take your knowledge. And I'm going to use my power. And we are going to kill that Philistine giant. And he says the same thing to you. He's going to take the abilities that he's given you. The talents that you have. All right? He's going to take the knowledge that you have. He's going to take the strength that you have and he's going to use his power and defeat your giant. Do you believe it? Because you have to stand face to face with the giants in this world if we're ever going to show the world that we have faith in God. Now David dealt with some things quickly that I want you to see. Four little things real quick that I want you to see and realize. Okay, Little lessons that you can take with simple living crisis faith. All right? Here's the first piece of advice that I can give you. Do not seek encouragement from people who are already defeated. What good does that do? Let me ask you this. If you have a drug problem or an alcohol problem, if you have an addiction, does it do you any good to ask someone who is addicted to help you become unaddicted? Huh? If you want to get off alcohol and the people that you hang around with on a daily basis are alcoholics, how's that going to help you? If you are addicted to drugs and the people that you hang around with every day of your life are the people who do drugs, how does that help you? If you have a relationship problem, a marital problem, okay? If you have a marital problem and you're getting advice from somebody who is divorced, how does that help you? You need to be seeking the advice of those who have already won the victories. Those who have faith and trust in God. Do not seek encouragement from the defeated. Look for the victorious. If you want to overcome an addiction, then you have to talk to those who have overcome addictions and use the power of God to overcome it. If you want to get through a tough relationship, then you've got to talk to those people who have fixed a broken relationship and made it work. If you want to deal with, with overcome financial problems, then you don't talk to people who have fought bankruptcy 14 times 
All that does is make you defeated. If you want to overcome it, then you talk to people who have overcome financial trouble. You see how it works? Don't seek the defeated for encouragement. His brothers were afraid. They couldn't help him. The king of Israel, Saul, was afraid, hiding in his tent. He couldn't help him. He got his confidence from what he had learned already. All right? So you can't seek encouragement from those that are already defeated. Think about it. All right? Now, he goes on and he starts, well, I want you to go with me and look at this verse because I at least want to I at least want to read. Um, come with me down to verse number. Uh, let's go to verse 45. Verse 45. All right. Verse 45. He says, <laughs> Then said David to the Philistine, Thou come at me with a sword. And with a spear, and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, and that's what I was telling you, the Lord of our extremity, the Lord of hosts, God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. Now, I want you to go all the way down to verse number 50 because I want us to look at verse number 52. Now, David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine, took his sword, the Philistine's own sword, took Goliath's own sword, drew it out <coughs> of the sheath and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Okay, so you can't take encouragement from the defeated because what David did is he went in, let me give you this part. You can't use somebody else's talents, abilities, armor, somebody else's army. It won't work. You remember what Saul did for him when he came in there? He put his... his um, <laughs> stuff on him. Right? He put his helmet on him. He put his coat of mail on him. He gave him his sword. Now remember, this is a six foot, six inch built muscular man. And he put all of that on a five foot seven skinny kid. And David couldn't hardly walk. He walked out of the tent with him. He said, I can't do this. He said, I can't even walk in this mess. So he took it all off. And he went and picked up his sick. And he went and picked up his slingshot. And he went and picked up five stones. And we know he slung the stone, sunk it in the forehead, knocked him out, made him fall over. Because Goliath was coming at him with all the stuff that he knew. But what David knew was how to defend himself. <clears throat> Why? Because... He depended on his last victory. He didn't depend on the armor of God. He didn't depend on what somebody else had done. But he used the next piece of advice. You have to depend upon your own abilities, not someone else's. You can't use somebody else's. What works for me to defeat my giants may not work for you. You have to use what abilities you have. You have to use what personality you have. You have to do what God has given you to overcome. What has God given you? That's what you have to use. Huh? 
Remember what God has done for you in your life. How many times has God helped you? <clears throat> How many times have you prayed, Lord, help me with this or help me with that, and you've overcome that situation? Remember those. Don't forget them. We tend to forget with every crisis situation we're in, with every jaunt we face, we tend to forget what God has already done. And never forget that it's through His power, not yours, His, that the giants are defeated in your life. What kind of faith do you have? Here's the last piece of advice. Remember when people come to you and persecute you and aggravate you <laughs> and try to put obstacles in your way? Because remember what Goliath did when he came off of that hill? The first thing that he did was made threats. He made threats. You say, well, David threatened him. No, David didn't. David told him what was going to happen. There's a difference between threatening somebody and telling somebody what's going to happen. All right? You come up and threaten me all you want to, but I can tell you what's going to happen. If you try to stand against what God is for, then you will be defeated. That I promise you. And that's not according to me. That's according to God and his word. Not because I'm strong or because you're strong, but because God is strong. So <laughs> here's the thing. Remember that your enemy's threats, that's all they are, are threats. They can't defeat you if you're walking in the will of God. If you are preparing yourself to fulfill the purpose of God. If you are doing the things that God needs for you to do to accomplish his will, you cannot be defeated because God is greater than all. Do, does it, everybody not remember 1 John 4, 4? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I've said that a lot here lately. There's no accident that we continue to say that. If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. Do we not remember the verses that God says his power is above all? Simple faith. Don't ever doubt that God can do it. There was no doubt in David's mind. And he proved that because he didn't just have simple faith. His faith was alive and well. He lived it every day. He lived showing the world that he had faith. If you go into James chapter 2, verse 17, he says, faith without works is dead, being alone. Then you go into verse 18, he says, now, you show me your faith without your works. You show me that you have faith by doing nothing. He said, I'll show you my faith by my works. Huh? He said, I'm going to show you my faith because it's living. It's alive. It's an action. Huh? What, what James was showing us is that true faith proves a changed life because the world can see a changed life. David had a changed life. He had living faith. And it stood because it was simple and because it was alive. It was a living, simple faith. It allowed him to overcome every crisis that he ever faced every giant that stood in front of him. Why? Because he simply trusted God. Now, do you have the faith to face your giants? And I promise you, every one of us in this world will face giants in our life. Every one of us are going to face situations that seem way bigger than we ever are. Okay, when, when you look at Goliath and David, it looked like a pit bull fighting a chihuahua. But the result was the exact opposite of what we would ever think. That little skinny kid 
took down that giant in his life simply because he had faith. Because he trusted God. And God's power did the rest. God says, you trust me, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. David stood and stood strong as a 17-year-old kid. Now, you think about a 17-year-old kid who's got that much faith. It should make those of us who are older ashamed at our lack of faith. What kind of faith do you have? Is it simple? Is it living so that you can face the giants in your life? What kind of faith do you have? Today's the day to change your path, to change your purpose, to accomplish what God needs you to accomplish. And it all starts by what kind of faith you have in Him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your glorious word. Lord, we thank you for these great biblical truths of hope that we can take and use and apply in our life. God, these glorious things that we can use that give us strength, that give us power because of your power. God, we pray today that you reveal in our hearts what kind of faith we truly have. And Lord, if it's not simple living faith that will help us in every crisis, then we pray, God, you help us today to get on the right path to accomplish your purpose so that we can be as David, a man or a woman after your own heart, that we could serve you, God, knowing that you are real and that you will take care of us and that you will fight our battles for us. Lord, we pray this this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody got?